Um, so our opening keynote speaker for today is another for forceful human rights campaigner, writer, and journalist. Uh, she was formerly the head of the gender unit at Amnesty International and was suspended due to criticizing Amnesty's heavy association with the Islamist group, Cage Prisoners. She served as a board member at many, uh, the board member at many women rights organizations, including the South Wall Black Sisters and Women Against Fundamentalism. Among her publications is Refusing Holy Orders, Women and Fundamentalism in Britain, uh, Legislating Utopia, Violence Against Women, Identities and Interventions. She, heads the, she, heads, she founded and heads the Center for Secular Space. It's my honor to introduce Gita Segal. Thank you, Nala. It's a really great day to be here. Um, nearly 70 years ago, in 1948, the great Dalit leader, Dr. Ambedkar, stood before the Indian Constituent Assembly and said, I personally do not understand why religion be given this vast, expansive jurisdiction so as to cover the whole of life and to prevent the legislature from encroaching upon that field. After all, what are we having this liberty for? India, after all, had just become independent. We are having this liberty in order to reform our social system, which is so full of inequities, discrimination, and other things, which conflict with our fundamental rights. Freedom in India had been won after a very long struggle against empire, but the men and 15 women of the Constituent Assembly were acutely aware that their task had just begun. Dismantling British rule was one thing, but dealing with social inequality, discrimination against women and oppressed castes still lay before them. For far too long, the history of secularism as a radical anti-imperialist social movement has been ignored, and histories of human rights have buried the enormous contribution made by movements for freedom across Asia and Africa. Contributions which have shaped the understanding of racial discrimination and apartheid, as well as sexual discrimination. And crucially, their importance in framing the human rights framework as we know it has been forgotten. As we approach the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we need to understand this history as a precious heritage, one which belongs to all of us. We need to look again at the concepts of genocide and crimes against human humanity to understand the rising tide of mass crimes committed against people because of their racial or religious identity as well as the refusal of a religious identity. Taken together, this body of human rights law helps to understand the present moment and gives us a framework to understand the ferocious onslaught of racism and fundamentalism and to tackle it. Today is the 25th of November, the start of 16 days of activism on the elimination of violence against women and it ends on Human Rights Day when One Law for All was founded 10 years ago. I think it's particularly fitting that we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of the One Law for All campaign, because Mariam Namazi has built a campaign which, though founded by ex-Muslims, has created the space for secularists of all kinds, including Muslim believers, to flourish, exchange ideas, evaluate evidence, strategize, and indeed win. And I think we have to remember that. It's a long struggle and there's a long one ahead, but we've won some victories on the way. Mariam, so often banned for being dangerous, has created an openness to ideas, an opposition to all forms of fundamentalism and racism, a strong program for the protection of refugees. Paradoxically, she's created a safe space for building a coalition. The One Law for All campaign is a principle of universality in action. And yes, it is dangerous. In her report on fundamentalism and extremism, Karima Benoun, the second, uh, the mandate holder on cultural rights, the special rapporteur on cultural rights said, we face a worldwide struggle to defend intellectual freedom and the rationality on which it is based. 
Moreover, at the heart of the fundamentalist and extremist paradigms are rejections of equality and the universality of human rights, making unwavering defense of these principles the touchstone of the human rights response. I think we need to understand universality as both an overarching concept of human rights and the skeleton which constitutes the framework of human rights. It is a test against which the respect for rights, the enjoyment of rights, and the indivisibility of rights can be measured. Working out the relationship between rights, balancing the rights of different groups, or indeed balancing between rights themselves, cannot be done without the principle of universality. Otherwise, it's just a collection, human rights becomes a collection of competing interests and becomes subjected to uh, an, an identity politics of, of uh, people claiming permanent victimhood. I want to jump ahead to the movement, to the, to the moment when the mass people's uprising that happened that became known as the Arab Spring turned into victories for the Middle Muslim Brotherhood across many Middle Eastern contexts. The absence of a truly universal framework by the major human rights organizations themselves meant that Human Rights Watch, rather than warning of the dangers that were clearly coming, decided to celebrate the victories of the Brotherhood. When many of us protested, we were called Islamophobes, like Gert Wilders. But of course, it was clear that there were extreme dangers in the victory. While Brotherhood spokesmen used terms like civil state to describe the kind of state they wanted when speaking to foreigners, to his followers, Mursi reversed the Egyptian saying that the Constitution should be the Quran of Egyptians. During the election, he shouted, the Quran is our Constitution, the Prophet Muhammad is our leader, jihad is our path, and death for the sake of Allah is our most lofty aspiration. He also said, the Sharia, then the Sharia, and finally the Sharia. This nation will enjoy blessing and revival only through the Islamic Sharia. It is often said that the Sharia is an elastic concept, that Muslim laws have differed through time and place, and many have been reformed many times. I have no quarrel with that view. What is clear, though, thinking of fundamentalist movements as modern political movements of the far right, which use religion to secure political ends, that the imposition of Sharia has little to do with the spiritual practice of religion, but rather the impositions of a package of laws of remarkable similarity. <laughs> <coughs> across Muslim majority countries and minority populations. In this sense, the imposition of Sharia denotes harsh punishments, blasphemy, impostasy laws, and a wholesale rejection of women's rights. Like Maryam, I'm talking about the Muslim Brotherhood rather than simply Boko Haram or Daesh, uh, or in India, the, uh, the uh, Bajrang Dal, or dozens of other terrorist groups. Because along with the jamaat e islami these are the respectable, uh, respectable face of Islamist movements. These are the movements of British commentators, such as, well, former undercover spy cops, Peter Oborn, the journalist, have assured us, have absorbed British values during their long exile in this country and respect for human rights. So what were their, what, among their first public acts? What did the Brotherhood do when it came out of hiding and were elected to office in those acclaimed elections? Well, they organized their four yearly conference and held it in Sudan. Think about that. President Bashir of Sudan is an international pariah. He had been indicted by the Security Council and the International Criminal Court for genocide in Darfur, Muslim on Muslim genocide. And yet there he was being praised uh, and supported uh, by the mass ranks of the Muslim Brotherhood from all across uh, the world, from Tunisia, from Egypt, Hamas, um, uh, uh, Sudan itself, and so on. And what else did they do while they were about it, uh, as well as lending their credibility and support, their legitimacy to this international pariah, Bashir? They also decided that they would uh, denounce the trial of war criminals in Bangladesh being held uh, at, at that time uh, as, an, as an attack on Muslims and Muslim leadership. So the jamaat e islami and the Muslim Brotherhood came together to defend genocide. <clears throat> the
There are, of course, many other things that happened at that time. The, the attack on Coptic churches in Egypt, the um, opening of the space for Salafis, the increase, uh, the, 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 the diminution of secular space. But those societies that were able to combat it were able to look much more clearly uh, at some of those issues and to, and to create an opposition to them to the extent that they had a kind of secular space in their countries. Now, as many of us know, secularism is a concept that has been very much under threat. As much as people across the world are appealing to secular values in defense of the very, of the very many battles that they're fighting in order to fight the far right, and whether it's the exclusion of refugees on the one hand or the, um, uh, the promotion of, uh, of religious laws, whether they're uh, uh, in the form of abortion, uh, anti-abortion laws, um, controlling women's bodies, uh, marriage laws, and so on. The, uh, the, the appeal is, is always to universal rights. But in the universities, we're told that, that secularism is a concept that is outdated, that it's a meta-narratives, meta-narratives have finished. Uh, all we can do now is sweat the small stuff. I think the academics who developed these theories really didn't see the mass movements that are going on today coming, and they have no means really of, um, of uh, understanding them, but they're still teaching kinds of things. So uh, I want to go back and look at how, these, how the issue, how universal rights became universal rights. And it's a story that's much bigger and more complicated <coughs> than has been understood. In the first place, a lot of the countries that were, that were still under colonial occupation uh, had gatherings across the world, including one in Manchester, uh, in which there were a lot of demobilized black soldiers, who, uh, which demanded an end to colonization and uh, colonialism and so on. The American left and the American black movement mobilized because America was a country of segregation and racialized laws. Uh, the newly decolonized countries both were at the table uh, when the Universal Declaration was being debated. And there were women from India and Pakistan who were sent as delegates and who played a crucial part in putting universal the framework that we know as universal rights in, uh, uh, into place. So I only have space to discuss a couple of clauses. There were many others that ensured that both social and political rights and uh, 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 civil and political rights and economic and social rights were part of uh, the declaration. Um, but there is also a clause on marriage. And I think people have not realized <coughs> including feminists such as myself, who spent much of the 90s thinking that we were the ones that were putting violence against women into the human rights framework. Uh, the term, the elimination of violence against women, gender-based violence and so on, are indeed new terms. But the clause on marriage, which said marriage should be at full age and of uh, free choice, that polygamy should be ended, and that people should be able to marry across different communities and religions, if they chose, is a revolutionary clause because it strikes at the heart of the control that patriarchies exercise of social reproduction. It is one of the key areas of battle in which people are fighting still today. And it was put in place not by feminists from the West, who in fact thought that it was quite irrelevant and Eleanor Roosevelt felt that it had no place in a civil rights document, uh, and, and she felt it was quite a vulgar issue to be discussing. It was put in place because Hansa Mehta, who was one of the delegates from India, and a feminist of long standing, who had produced a charter of women's rights with Indian women in the course of the, the national movement, which called for um, a whole uh, sh uh, sh a series of rights which we would be proud if we actually had today, such as equal pay for equal work, um, uh, you know, uh, mar these marriage laws, uh, ending the stigma of illegitimacy, uh, a whole range of different um, 
values that they had been proposing, had debated in the 30s and 40s and proposed. Um, she insisted uh, that this go in uh, to the marriage laws. And in, uh, Begum Ikramullah from Pakistan supported it. She also said that we need these laws. Now she did it in a slightly uh, careful way, shall we say, uh, in that she, while Saudi Arabia was completely opposed, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, to these laws because they said Islam was perfect and had all the various rights, including divorce rights, uh, and so on, and actually uh, it all happened much quicker and women were much better protected in Islam and they didn't see the need for this clause. And Begum Ikramullah said, yes, well, uh, of course Islam is perfect, but uh, we do need these rights because one, they're consistent with what we're, argue we're arguing uh, in Pakistan uh, as rights for women. <coughs> and it's also we need them for people who don't have laws as perfect as ours. <laughs> and so that clause did pass. It passed, but it also, that little debate had the seeds of some of the problems that might perhaps go before. There's also a huge debate on the clause of freedom of religion, because it was not only the freedom of religion or belief and worship, but the freedom to leave religion that was absolutely embedded in the universal human rights framework itself. And Bega Mikramullah, who was so progressive on the marriage issue, was not really sure that she, as, uh, as a newly formed Muslim state, whether she should vote for the clause uh, saying that you could actually be allowed to leave religion. Um, and so there was a little bit of a problem over there. But at this point, Eleanor Roosevelt went to Zafarullah Khan one of the great diplomats and founders of Pakistan, who's also an Ahmadi. And he said he stood up and voted for this clause and said that, and quoting from the Quran, saying, let him who believes believe, and he who disbelieves disbelieve. And that is actually a particularly poignant because Ahmadis have been made illegal, they've been ruled out of, uh, uh, of existence in Pakistan. Uh, they're under extreme threat uh, if, if uh, their existence is discovered, if they are seen to be masquerading as Muslims, such as uh, giving a Muslim greeting or doing very normal things that Muslims may do, like worship in, in uh, communion and so on. And yet he, as a founder of Pakistan, led Pakistan at this moment uh, towards uh, a, a, a very progressive uh, set of laws. And Egypt's Wahid Rafat also accepted the language on marriage and uh, the, the other clauses, uh, and so did um, Muhammad Habib from India. So Muslims from all across the world were involved, centrally involved, with making sure that freedom to marry and to marry whom you want, as well as um, uh, freedom to believe what you want or not to believe. Uh, without that support, the Universal Declaration would not have gone through as a consensus document. And I think it's really important that we remember it uh, at this moment. I'm going to end there because we have a very important speaker that I'm sure that you'll, be, that you'll be wanting to hear. Uh, Saif ul Maluk has the distinction of having risked his life as the lawyer of Afia, Af, Asya Bibi. I didn't know till a few minutes ago that he has another distinction as well. He came to the defense of Asya Bibi after he prosecuted Mumtaz Kadri, the killer of Salman Taseer. Is that, am I correct? Who was turned into a national hero in Pakistan and whom hundreds of thousands of people mobilized to defend. Few people were willing to step up and defend him. But Asma Jahangir, whom we sadly lost recently, 
the great human rights lawyer in Pakistan, uh, who has stood for secularism in Pakistan through its long and checkered and difficult history, uh, suggested to the Chief Justice that there was one man who would step up to the plate and do, conduct this extremely dangerous prosecution. Saiful Maluk, we are very honored to have you here. Please come to the platform.